So today we continue with verse 10. And uh, verse 10 says, Teshama satata yuktanama bhajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayantite. And Prabhupada's translation is this To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give you the understanding by which, by which uh, they can come to me. It's a, mar it's a miracle, this verse. It's a miracle. To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give you the understanding by which they can come to me. If you're devoted and you love God, you get everything. The grand prize. You get everything. You get full understanding of Krishna. And then you get to return to the Krishna in yourself. You get to return to Godhead. So satata yuktanam. Satata just means all, constantly. And yuktanam is this beautiful word, which is linked to the word yoga, which everybody knows. Yukta means union, joined. And bajat, bajatama, that's this, of course, uh, service that you know that word is, as well. So the ones who are joined to me constantly, who are connected with me, have a relation with me, by doing devotional service, by doing bhajam, bhajatam, these are the ones who will receive this gift from me. The, my point is that it's not just doing service towards some strange God far away. It's by having a, a yukta, a union, a relationship with God. It's by having a loving relationship, a friendship with God, like the friendship of Krishna and, um, and Arjuna. And this is what Radha Mohan is. Radha Mohan is a relation. It's a loving relation. It's loving relation made alive. So those of us who can be like that or be close to that, to loving relation, those are the ones who will receive the knowledge and and be given the the path to 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 come and be with, with Krishna. And there's another little detail in the Sanskrit that's very beautiful. It's not just looking, it's not just uh, those who give love to me, he says. It's those who give priti purvakam. Priti purvakam. It means, well, priti means love, kindness, uh, care, and then purva kam, purva, you mean, you know, you, uh, you know, purva just means old or original, the original. So it's the love he wants is the original love. The one we were given, that love we were given when we were created. Priti Purvaka means that love that we had when we were pure, when we were when we were first created as, as souls. That's the divine in us. So when uh, Prabhupada talks about the back to Godhead, we are going back to that. We're going back to this original, pure, ecstatic love. 
It's a very special way of saying love. It's not just love. Yes, I love God. Great. Yes, I love you. Very good. It's that I give to you the original love which with, which, with which I was created, the greatest and purest love with which I was created. So this means for day-to-day -day life, our practice that we're, we try to feel in ourselves what that original love is. And as you know, always by cleaning away the, the coverings, the material dirt that covers up our love, that hides our love, that's what we want to find. When we say we want to find who we are, <clears throat> it's this love we want to find. It's funny in the in the West. I don't know in Japan, but in in the West, in Europe, we talk about having an identity crisis. Mostly when we're younger in life, teenager or like this, twenties. Who am I? Who am I? I need to find myself. I can't, I'm having an identity crisis. But what's strange is that what we're looking for there in the West, when we're having an identity crisis, is what are my qualities? What is my best job? What am I good at? What am I bad at? What am I smart for? What am I stupid for? What should I do in my life? But here, when we talk about Priti Purvakam, this, this ecstatic original love, we want to find out who we are in terms of who is who are, who are the lover, who is the lover that I am? How do I love? It's not what should I do? Should I become a... Should I become an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or a taxi driver? It's how should I love? When I'm completely me, what kind of lover am I? This is the question we ask. This is what we look for. This is what we feel we should look, seek to feel because it's in us. How do I love? So obviously this isn't an intellectual question. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a, it's a question of feeling. So Krishna is saying, don't come to me with your brain, please. Come to me with your heart. Let go of your head. It's the miracle, miracle of the, of the soul, that Krishna wants to join with in this yukatam. So when we meditate, even in just everyday meditation, let's think about what is that, what is that lover in me? How do I make union with others? Real union, not contracts and uh, sending letters and emails, but real union. How do I make that? What connects two loving souls, living souls? What is it that connects people? It's really such a simple question, but we don't ever ask it. You know, I can say, well, what connects me to, to my neighbor? Because my neighbor is very nice, and, and sometimes he uh, gives me some, some butter when I'm out of butter in my kitchen, and uh, sometimes I sweep his his road. But if we take away these external things, what is really there? What connects us? What is the connection between two people who, who live in this world? Yes, I can hold my husband's hand. That's very nice. And we're joined together in a way. But what about the person across the room? What about the person you cannot see? What about the person in Tokyo? 
What is linking me to her? Something. In terms of spirit, I'm just as linked with you in Japan as I'm linked with, with my neighbor who gives me the butter. Because we're linked by the soul. The connection between us is that we share a soul. Take away all those things that keep us apart, the material things, all the differences between us that block us from being unified. Maybe all the things we don't like. Maybe all the things that we don't want to deal with. Let all that fall away from our minds and there will stay something. All the things I don't like, I don't like, uh, I don't like people with big feet. I don't like people who don't speak German. I don't like, you know, there's a hunt, there's a long list, but if we take them all away, something is left. Something precious and central. And I don't need to tell you what this is. It's the loving soul. And it connects us all. It connects us also with people we don't even know. It connects us through feelings, through a common spiritual link, let's say. And when you feel this completely, when you feel connected with your husband or your children, and then when you can feel connected with your God brothers and God sisters, then it's growing. I feel close to you always. And then it'll expand beyond that. And you'll feel close to people who are not your brothers and sisters. And then you feel close to people you don't even know. And you walk in the street uh, in the middle of Tokyo, which is crazy with people. And you'll feel in love with everybody you cross. That's when you've arrived. Then you'll be in Priti Priya Purvekam. So in your meditation, you know, think about what you don't need to be related to that person. And think about what absolutely cannot be taken away. And you'll find your pure loving soul. Because that's exactly what is connecting you. You and when you reach that, and, and when I reach it, because I have not, then you will have found your your center, your pure, loving, your soul, your true spiritual self, your Svarupa. So I think this is what Krishna is talking about when he's saying, when you relate to me in this way, constantly, constantly, deep, deeply with, with uh, Priti Purvaram. This is the kind of love we're, we're talking about. And then, then of course, this is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to us, to help us to, to show this. Indeed, I wouldn't be talking to you today. We wouldn't be together if it were not for Mahaprabhu, who, to, who told us about this link between souls and that it's made of love. Um, and then the, the, well, the word that always interests Gurudev very much when he discusses this verse is um, uh, buddhi yogam, buddhi yogam. See, let's see, how does it say? Dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upyanata te, which he translates. I give you understanding, dadami buddhi yogam tam, I give you understanding, by which they can come to me. Yena mam, to me, upianti, te, they can come. And it's this word, buddhi yogam, which is a very special word. Buddhi means, basically, means intelligence. But buddhi yogam, intelligence in union, yogam, this word again, you remember, yogam, union, Intelligence of union is this spiritual connection, this deep and strong spiritual intelligence that lets us know God so deep, 
so rich, so strong that it leads us to a relationship with God himself. That's what Buddhi Yogam is. And this is what Krishna says. He says, I give you this understanding, Buddhi Yogam. And through that understanding, <clears throat> not only do you understand me and you can love me completely, but you can come to me. And by come to me, Upyantite, he means come back to Godhead. Come back home. Come back to your constitutional position. Come back to your Svarup. So by giving you this understanding, Buddhi Yogam, I will give you the tool, the roadmap. Remember, Gurudev is our navigator. I will give you the roadmap to come back to me, which means to come back to who you are spiritually, your Svarup. So it's very, very strong verse and very, very strong uh, word, Buddhi Yogam, that I learned, that we learn from, about from Gurudev very often. And now I haven't even read uh, Prabhupada, so I read a little bit of him. I'm sorry. Lots of talking. What does Prabhupada say about this? He says, in this verse, the word Buddhi Yogam is very significant. We may remember that in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, the Lord instructing Arjuna said that he had spoken to him of many things and that he would instruct him in the way of Buddhi Yoga. And now Prabhupada says, now Buddhi Yoga is explained. He continues, Buddhi Yogam itself is action in Krishna consciousness. Action in Krishna consciousness. That is the highest intelligence, he says. Buddhi means intelligence, and Yogam means mystic activities or mystic elevation. I was going to say mystic connection, mystic union. Prabhupada continues, when one tries to get back home, back to Godhead, and takes fully to Krishna consciousness in devotional service, his action is called Buddhi Yogam. In other words, Buddhi Yogam is the process by which one gets out of the entanglement of this material world. The ultimate goal of progress is Krishna, he says. So here Prabhupada puts it in terms of action, right? He calls it a kind of action. Action in Krishna consciousness. And that means action that's done in devotion. Action that's done with love. Action that's done in full presence with ourselves, being who we are spiritually. Action that's done once, once we've understood, um, once we've understood what our material attachments are, so that we know how to let them go. It's action that we can do once we've meditated through all our material connections and actions and existence and set it aside. So we think, we meditate, and we say that part is material and 
nothing about it is necessary. It might be fun, it might be interesting, it might be uh, curious, but I can do without it. It's not making me who I am. Those are all the material connections. Those are all the material coverings. They're not necessary for me to be me. Put them aside, gently. Put them in a closet in your mind. All those things. My nice, uh, my nice shoes. They make me look like me, but I can still be me without them. Or this car. Or my tennis playing. Or my job. All these things are very good, but they're not who I am at the core. I can lose them and I would stay the same. So we put all those things in a closet and then we're coming closer and closer to this, to this experience of Asfarup, who we are deeply. Meditating like this means understanding that even though we are in the material world, we are not of the material world. I hope that lets that can be translated. <laughs> even though we're not in, uh, even though we are in the material world, we live in it. We do our things in it. We have to eat, and we have to have a house, and we have to have, we have to have uh, transport and all the rest. But we're not made of this. We're not made of this material world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And when we can fully understand that in our minds, in our meditations, in our hearts, then we are back home, In to use Prabhupada's word. And we're back home with ourselves, in our sarup. We're fully in our hearts. We're in the buddhi yoga. <laughs> We're in this spiritual intelligence that connects us to, to Krishna. And let's see, Prabhupada goes on and he says, people do not know this, this fact about going home. Therefore, the association of devotees and a bona fide spiritual master are important. Why don't we know it? Because we can't know it. We can only experience it. It's not in the books. There's no school class you can attend in order to learn this. It can only be it can only be understood through loving relation. Through through relation with devotees. Through relation with Guru, of course, and with others who share experience uh, like this. Let's see, Prabhupada goes on then, and he says, one should know that the goal is Krishna. And when the goal is assigned, then the path is slowly but progressively traversed. And the ultimate goal is achieved. This this comment by Prabhupada, you might remember, is a is a favorite of Gurudev. One should know that the goal is Krishna, and when the goal is assigned, then the path is slowly but progressively traversed. Traversed. This means we can we follow it. We can follow it easily. We can follow the path because we have a navigator. Now, we have someone to show us the way. We still have to do the walking ourselves, but we have someone who shows us which way to go. So this assigned, this means that once we are committed to this goal, once we are engaged, once we say, yes, that is my goal, then we can enter into into um, 
devotional relation. But this engagement, and that's the important part, this assigning, this doesn't come from uh, the, uh, the accountant's office. You don't go to a lawyer for this assigning. You, go, you don't go to the notary in your neighborhood to, to sign this contract. This, this assigning you do with your heart. It's not in technical language. It's not in legal language, this contract. It's in spiritual language. So the commitment we make is one of giving of our souls, not of giving something like in a transaction, like buying a house or something, or signing a job contract. It means commit, committing to thinking spiritually, to thinking lovingly, and admiring and, 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 and recognizing the divine in, in the world. And through that, <laughs> we still have this idea of the path, and Guru can help us to... Guru can help us with that, with finding that path. So now Prabhupada reused the three kinds of uh, yoga, three which are, again, three ways of union with the divine, three ways of ex living in the world spiritually, and three ways of um, moving towards our goal, which is Krishna consciousness. So he says the following, when a person knows the goal of life, but is addicted to the fruits of activities, he's, in, he's acting in karma yoga, karma yoga. Karma means work or activity, productive activity. Huh? Or cause and effect, we say when we talk about karma in the Western way, it's about cause and effect, what acts cause other effects. But there's there's nothing evil about this, about karma yoga. Remember, Prabhupada says, we know the goals of life. So we know where we're going. This is probably the case for many of us. We know what we want. We know what is important. But we still feel like it's important to do our material activities. So it's a very good start on the way. It's already infinitely higher than all the all the uh, all the, the existing uh, beings on the in the universe. It's already very advanced, even though it's not the top level. Then there's Jnana Yoga. There's, he says, Prabhupada says, when he knows that goal. I'm sorry. That when he knows that the goal is Krishna, but he takes pleasure in mental speculations. To understand Krishna, he is acting in Jnana Yoga. So arguing about the philosophical principles and the and the and the shastras and um, bickering about what is uh, what is the right interpretation and the wrong interpretation. This is also very elevated, but also not ideal. And then, of course, the third part. When he knows the goal and seeks Krishna completely in Krishna consciousness and devotional service, he's acting in bhakti yoga or buddhi yoga, which is the complete yoga. Because it's fully committed, the assigning then is a complete commitment to the heart. And Prabhupada continues, um, sorry. The complete yoga is the highest perfectional stage of life. And then he says something interesting. A person may have a bona fide spiritual master, a guru, and may be attached to a spiritual organization, but still, if he is not intelligent enough to make progress, then Krishna, from within, gives him instructions so that he may ultimately come to him without difficulty. Very interesting, because he talks about Krishna within. 
So even if you're, you have a nice guru and you have nice devotee brothers and sisters, but you're not making it because it's too difficult, Krishna will come to you from within your heart and and help you along the way. And then the next line takes another term which is very important in Gurudev's uh, in Gurudev's, in Gurudev's teaching about qualification. Prabhupada says, the qualification is that a person always engage himself in Krishna consciousness and with love and devotion render all kinds of services. To engage himself in Krishna consciousness means engage himself in this full presence of with the soul, setting away the material parts of our consciousness, and then also with love and devotion, doing work with love and devotion. He should perform some sort of work for Krishna, says Prabhupada, and that work should be with love. There is one qualification. Wait, I think actually. So basically there is, uh, I want to check the text. There's one qualification, essentially. That's the only one. And we joke there's no qualification needed sometimes. And we say the only qualification is to be unqualified. This is very beautiful the word of Gurudev. But there's one qualification. And that's what we, that we do, what we do with love. So we can let all material qualifications go, all need for possessions, and we can let all intellectual qualifications go, all competence in philosophy and ideas and science. We, we can, no, we must throw away the idea that who we are, our value, our identity comes from what we have, what our material experiences are, and we have to we have to come to the understanding that our value our value comes from our our souls and from the love in our hearts. So please don't tell me how many pages of Bhagavatam you read last night. Tell me how great a lover you are. Then we'll be talking about values in, in, in bhakti. So how greatly advanced your heart is in loving. How purely can you love your mother, your wife, your husband, your children, your friends? This is what is, this is, this is the highest value in Krishna consciousness. What's very beautiful is that we can develop this love in the material world. Indeed, it's it's the best place to do it in a way, because there are so many challenges. It's very difficult to love your boss sometimes in the material world. But if you can uh, rise to the point of loving your boss, when it's very it's a very unpleasant person, then you've really shown that you are made, that your soul is is made of love. But the point is that this the value, our value, maybe value is the wrong word. The specialness of who we are comes from the love in our hearts, from our ability to to love, from the strength of our love, from the sin sincerity and clarity of our love. I used to think it was all about how hard I could be. I could be better at work because I could work longer, drink more coffee and 
and produce more things. But now I see it's about being softer, about having a softer heart, about having more humility, having a more cl clear idea about what is beautiful in my colleagues. So this is, if there's a qualification, it's this one. That's the qualification for acting in bhakti yoga, uh, buddhi yoga. We have to be lovers. We must act as lovers. But the good news is that we are already lovers. We're already experts. We just, we forget sometimes. We were born experts, top experts. Loving is our deepest nature. It's our earliest experience in life, loving and being loved. We're all natural born lovers. You don't need to learn to dance. You don't need to learn to make love. You don't need to learn to be sweet and buy roses. We are all born perfect lovers. And then we got a little bit lost. We forgot. So all we have to do is remember the lover within, how qualified we are to love other people and to love God. And we'll find our way back. Lover is the very first thing we are. Very first thing. The strongest and the best as a child. And then it, and then it passes away, doesn't it? So it's the very first thing we are. The question is, will it be the last and only thing we are? Will it be the last thing we are? That's the question for us in our practice. We started lovers, will we end lovers? Then Prabhupada continue, finishes the commentary by saying, if a devotee is intelligent enough, he will make progress on the path of self-realization. Now, when he says intelligent, he means buddhi, buddhi yoga intelligence, spiritual intelligence, wise intelligence, right? And finally, if one is sincere and devoted to the activities of devotional service, the Lord gives him a chance to make progress and ultimately attain him. Um, Feel free to share if you like. I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I see it's on. It's just an hour, but I feel like I'm talking a lot. Now. I often do that. And if not, then we'll carry on with uh, verse 11, which also contains many important elements. Te sam evanukam pataram tam Aham agnana yam tamaha nashyami atma bhavasto jnana dipena basvata. Prabhupada translates out of compassion for them, I dwelling in their hearts destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance. Out of compassion for them, I, dwelling in their hearts, destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance. There's really so many interesting things happening here. First of all, Krishna says, I'm dwelling in their hearts. 
Krishna is living in our hearts. From that place in our hearts, he's giving us compassion, he's giving us love. So Krishna has compassion for the devotee, it means he has kindness and pity and mercy and um, sympathy and love. So once we are, once we identify ourselves as a devotee, once we act with love and devotion, then Krishna gives it back to us. Something also that Gurudev often says, I love you as in return for the love you give to me, exactly as much. And then again, Krishna is inside our, our hearts. His love is already inside our hearts. The love we have that I was trying to describe before, the original lovers that we all are, this comes from Krishna's love, from Radharani's loving energy. And so Krishna is expressing love for us based on the love already in our, in our hearts. We are a part and parcel of God. So it's that little bit of God in us, that little part and parcel of God in us, which is where our love comes from, where our status as uh, lovers comes from. And then the third part of the verse, he's destroying uh, ign ignorance. Sorry, destroying with the shining lamp of knowledge, the darkness born of ignorance. So we talked a lot about fools, haven't we, in this in these on these Wednesdays, on these Thursdays, we talked about fools just there. And just like there are two kinds of fools, there are two kinds of ignorance. The one kind of ignorance is about getting the facts from. You say it's one o'clock when it's five o'clock. Then you're ignorant. But there's the much richer and more important ignorance, which says that you're not asking the right question. That you're not that the, that what is important is not about the facts. It's about the the soulful feelings. And this is the kind of ignorance that uh, Krishna is talking about in this verse. He's saying, with my bright light, the bright light of my love, I'm teaching you how to look for the right things in, in life. I'm not telling you that uh, you should have 10 toes on your feet. I'm telling you that you should be searching for your loving self in everything you do. So it's the ignorance about the, the question that you're, you're asking. Our darkness comes from the ignorance of our soul. And this is an ignorance that's everywhere amongst jivas. And it's not ignorance because we we got a question wrong. It's ignorance because we forgot our soul. We forgot that we're lovers. We forgot and we thought the right thing to do was to enjoy the material pleasures because there are so many and we're so good at enjoying them. We've forgotten that we're spiritual beings, forgotten that we're um, born to be lovers. This is what the ignorance is he's talking about, I think. And then Krishna is there to remind us. Remind us that we're souls. Mahaprabhu is there to remind us that we're lovers. And to remind us what loving really looks like. So we just need a little bit of reminding. Sometimes we jivas. And then Prabhupada talks about Chaitanya. He says in the commentary, when Lord Chaitanya was in Benares, promulgating the chanting, chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krita Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Promulgating means spreading. Thousands of people were following him. Uh, Prakashananda, very influential and learned scholar in Benares, at that time, 
derided, criticized Lord Chaitanya for being a sentimentalist. Prabhupada continues, sometimes philosophers criticize the devotees because they think that most of the devotees are in the darkness of ignorance and are philosophically naive sentimentalists. I, uh, I have a very close relationship to this problem, as you know. Most of you know I'm a philosopher and a writer in my job. And um, earlier, earlier, earlier in my career, in my work, I used to, when I worked, I would put all the important books around me on my desk. And then I'd sit down and write from them, bring them all together. And now when I write, I sit at an empty desk and I close my eyes and I feel. And those philosophers that think that I'm ignorant, <laughs> And in the darkness, they say I should write more books. More and more books. I've already written many books. There's a mountain of books. And the problem is that, of course, when I leave my body in a few years, all these books will be destroyed. They'll be thrown in the trash. Actually, some of the books that I wrote 20 years ago, nobody reads anymore. But the things I write from what I feel will make not mountains of books, but mountains of emotions. Mountains of emotions on my desk. So high, so high that I won't be able to see over them. And when I leave my body in a few years, they'll all come with me. So tell me now, who is the ignorant fool? <laughs> so Prabhupada says something like that. He says, let's see. Actually, that is not the fact. There are very, very learned scholars who have put forward the philosophy of devotion. But even if a devotee does not take advantage of their literatures or of his spiritual master, if he is sincere in devotional service, he is helped by Krishna himself within his heart. So this is what comes from the verse, you remember, that Krishna is in our hearts helping us. So some writers can manage to express emotions, and some of them are very sincere. That means they... You know, they speak from their hearts. And though for those writers, the success of their writing or their thinking is not the content of what they say, but, but the emotional uh, honesty of what they say. So, then Prabhupada continues. So, the sincere devotee engaged in Krishna consciousness cannot be without knowledge. Okay, so we need knowledge. It's not bad. The only qualification is that one carry out devotional service in full Krishna consciousness. So we can read the books, we can study the books, we can learn, study our Sanskrit, but everything we do with those words needs to be done with love, with devotion, with in Krishna consciousness. That is the criteria. Now he goes on, on this point, uh, Prabhupada says, the modern philosophers think that without discriminating, one cannot have pure knowledge. So in other words, modern philosophers think you have to have the emotional stuff on one side and then the scientific stuff on the other side. Otherwise, it's nonsense. 
They think that there's devotion on the one side, okay, but science on the other side. But others of us look to see the love in the science. We look to see how science expresses <laughs> devotion and love. Yeah. Prabhupada goes on then, he says, from them, from these philosophers, this answer is given by the Supreme Lord. Those who are engaged in pure devotional service, this is what Krishna says, even though they might be without sufficient education, and even without sufficient knowledge of the Vedic principles, are still helped by the Supreme God, as stated in the verse. So, those who are not philosophers, those who don't have this kind of enlightenment, intellectual um, talent, they are helped by Krishna as well. And these are the ones that uh, Krishna is interested in, in a sense. But then he goes in, uh, even farther, and then we'll come to the end of this verse, I think. He goes a little farther, and Prabhupada, and says, the Lord tells Arjuna that basically there is no possibility of understanding the supreme truth, the absolute truth, the supreme personality of Godhead, simply by speculating. For the supreme truth is so great that it is not possible to understand him or to achieve him simply by making a mental effort. So speculating, what is speculating? That's thinking without feeling. So this is what a, this is what a biologist would do or a physicist or the kind of philosophers that uh, Prabhupada doesn't, does not like. They think and they logic and they reason, but there's no heart behind it. And without this heart, says says Prabhupada, we cannot reach the, the supreme truth. He goes on saying, man, man can go on speculating for several million years. And if he's not devoted, if there's no love, if there's no devotional love. If he has not a lover, if he is not a lover of supreme truth he will never understand Krishna or the Supreme Truth. So it's not enough to be a lover of knowledge like we say philosophers are. It's really a lover of facts. You have to be a lover of the truth of God and have a loving relationship to that, have a desire and a, and a longing for this. So it's a really it's a really important point. We have to again connecting knowing and loving in order to know about God. We have to love God. We can only get to the the number of facts. If we're lover of facts, then once we know all the facts, God will still be on, be beyond that. God is beyond all the facts, so we'll, we're stuck. We're stopped. But if we love we love God, then we'll find a deeper knowing of God. And therefore, the, the same idea that we say so many times now in this class, that, that knowing only happens through a loving relationship. And therefore, the only qualification is to love, to have love in the heart. And this is what Prabhupada says kind of in this conclusion now, only by devotional service, is the Supreme Truth, Krishna, pleased. And by his inconceivable energy, he can reveal himself to the heart of the pure devotee. This inconceivable energy is Radharani's energy. It's the energy of love. That's how he can reveal himself to the heart of the devotee. Of course, how else would he get into our heart if it weren't through love, by opening the door of love? So it's Radharani who lets Radharani, the goddess of love, who lets Krishna into our hearts. The fact that we feel this at all, that we have access to the, the supreme truth, comes by the mercy of Radharani. There's no other way. The pure devotee, Prabhupada says, the pure devotee always has Krishna within his heart. 
Therefore, he is just like the sun that dissipates the darkness of ignorance. So lovely, really beautiful language. This is the special mercy rendered to the pure devotee by Krishna. And Prabhupada Gauzan says, due to the contamination of material association, through many, many millions of births, one's heart is always covered with the dust of materialism. But when one engages in devotional service and constantly chants Hare Krishna, the dust quickly clears and one is elevated to the platform of pure knowledge. The ultimate goal of Vishnu can be attained by this chant and by devotional service and not by mental speculation or argument. The pure devotee does not need to worry about the necessities of life. He need not be anxious. Oh, yeah. See, you say devotional service, my dear. Radhe, 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 Radhe. What is this devotional service? My dear. What is it? Explain, you mean. I mean, devotional is also love in action, no? Exactly. Uh, eh? Yes. So nowhere to escape from love is devotion. Right? Right. That is the beauty, what you are explaining us. That's a beauty. We ex deviate is ignorance. Yes. From the purity of the soul. And this is the test. How much I am pure in that devotional service. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Radhe Gurudev. You are so beautiful telling mm -hmm. that I never listen like this. Mm -hmm. Honestly. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just finishing now. There was just one more line, I think, here, and then we'll stop. And we can share a little bit if you like. Um, the pure devotee does not have to worry about the necessities of life. He need not be anxious, because when he removes the darkness from his heart, everything is provided automatically by the Supreme Lord for he is pleased by the loving devotional service of the devotee. This is the essence of the, of the Gita's teaching. By studying Bhagavad Gita, one can become a completely surrendered soul to the Supreme Lord and engage himself in pure devotional service as the Lord takes charge. One becomes completely free from all kinds of materialistic endeavors. There we'll stop for today. Uh, next time is the, this big, big change now in verse 12 and 13 when Arjuna starts talking. So Arjuna somehow becomes completely convinced by the end of verse um, 11. And now he's going to talk back and tell us what Krishna is to him. It's, so this is really the... Um, Right here today, it's the top point of Bhagavad Gita. So I'm listening to you, if anyone has. Yeah, oh, the, my yeah, dear, oh. my Peter, beautiful. Yeah, oh. yeah I all good. You are great, Mahatma. And one... My very close friend uh, is here, Siddhanta from America. 
see him and little share with him. Radhe Radhe Bhaiya. Yes, sir. It's very extremely enlightening uh, discourse on the Gita. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, there you are, I see. Hello. Yes, uh, it's an extremely enlightening discourse, and I really appreciate the depth to which you go to and extract the substance mm -hmm. that we're all searching for. Um, I just had some realizations that I just wanted to get your feedback. Um, so, this whole idea of intelligence and um, understanding, of course, through, through our devotional service, it's very clear. Um, but some um, situations come to mind. I've spent a lot of time in India, in the villages, in West Bengal. And this is where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did a lot of his preaching. And in those days, many of the people didn't have any education. They were basically illiterate. Um, they were just very much um, captured by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's love. Mm. And today I've witnessed in villages people worshipping their Lord Gopa with such childlike, pure love of God. I mean, they consider this Gopal their own child, and they're so much um, engaged in this loving service. Mm. And they may have some familiarity with some Gita verses, but it's just this whole spirit that you're describing of this really pure devotion in service, in action, um, that really, like, you know, touches me. And I'm like, wow. In the West, you know, we're all like after putting letters after our names and getting these qualifications that you described. <laughs> yeah. And these seem, and these seem like <laughs> huge obstacles for us because mm. we're trained from an early age how to be critical thinkers, how to analyze, how to justify, um, always putting ourselves in the center, what's good for me, you know, what can I derive from this knowledge. And this seems like a huge obstacle, at least for me personally, to get bogged down in the intellectual approach. And um, I've noticed that, um, again, no, I'm not directing criticism at anyone. That's the farthest thing from my mind when I say this, but it seems like many of the, the people in the highest positions in these spiritual organizations um, are, the, are, are, are top scholars. In other words, they've devoted their lives to um, you know, really delving deep into scripture and explaining and writing very, very detailed books about different philosophies. And my question is, um, how do we as devotees um, approach Krishna in the purest way? In other words, um, how do we, um, you know, find our way through this maze of all of this knowledge and books, and I don't, I don't call it speculation, but it's not. I mean, it's wonderful. Um, isn't it somehow simpler and easier if we just take a childlike approach? Um, for example, there could be a, a child of a devotee, and we know children like to play with dolls. They like to dress them up. They like to pretend feeding them. Um, and a child of eight or nine years can have a very close and intimate relationship with the, with the Ishtadev. And he can be reading the uh, Krishna Kata, hearing Krishna Kata about the stories of Radha Krishna and loving pastimes, and, and still get this really kind of going into this uh, Manjari Bhav, which we're mm -hmm. all after. In other words, isn't this, is this possible, number one? And shouldn't we approach things more in a childlike attitude of surrender? Because the children, they don't question. You know, they just, the child hears a fairy tale, and to them, that's truth. You see, you see where I'm coming from with this? Yes, yes, I do. So I'd just like to get kind of your feedback on this. Mm, well, there are two parts on it. The one, the one about child raising, I'm not at all qualified to to answer, but there are several people there in Munger Mandir who are, who are raising children, you might, who are raising them in this, in this natural way you're talking about, that they learn about, they learn about this tradition by reading, hearing fairy tales on the, on the bed every night, you know, just like, 
just like we did in the West. Uh, it seems um, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert, but it seems to me to be really a, a very beautiful way of uh, introducing this this feeling, this way of caring, this way of uh, relating with each other, this way of loving into children who are wide uh, wide open to it. But I, I've never tried it. Like I say, there's some god brothers and sisters there. At, they may be in the room, actually. I can't quite see who are raising children in the in that way. But the other part of your question is is maybe even more important because they're more. Uh, there's much more to lose, and that is that we should, we who are already grown up, should be childlike, <coughs> and and that this childlike approach is. Um, is is really what what uh, Krishna is talking about in Bhagavad Gita? It's to let off all these pretenses of intellect and start from the heart. And I think it's really what he means when he talks about going back to Godhead, and when Gurudev talks about going back to the constitutional position. He he's talking about going back to our childlike hearts, like I mentioned a, a few moments ago. You'll find, maybe you know already, one of Gurudev's favorite um, New Testament quotes is the Third Corinthians about um, see, looking through a glass darkly. When I was a child, I saw things childishly, and now I'm old, and I look through the world and see see it through a gla as through a glass darkly. So I think it's uh, it's really the it's kind of a model for us, really, the childlike thinking and the childlike way of loving which is very pure uh, and in a way completely generous, but on the other hand, I guess, very egoistical. <laughs> but in any case, this is indeed a model. Yeah, and I think that's what um, Kanisha is getting at in this verse too, when he says, those who are not uh, intellects, they, uh, it's fine, I'll come into their hearts too and, and show them the path. That's, uh, that's, that's the question. Very good question. I would like to ask something. Uh, uh, about Who is it I can't see? Huh? Who is it I can't see? Bandana. Oh, so nice. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, it's connected to the last uh, point um, that you went here in discussing about uh, the childlike mind. And uh, it came to my um, mind that this is a kind of quality of the mind uh, that we, if we could, like if we have a dream or a memory that is quite long ago, it's not, um, it's, it's all quite similar in a way. It's, it's past, something that has happened in the past, or I had a dream mm. now, and maybe I, I did not experience it now. So, um, you, you see what I'm pointing at, or what mm. to ask you, um, if it's in this kind of quality of mind, if we remember something or listen to a pastime, that uh, it's there is a kind of part in our mind that is judging, oh, this is a dream, or this is <clears throat> a long, not the way memory, but if this judging part is uh, quieting down, there is no difference between these um, memory, dream, or experience. Hmm. Absolutely, this is such a wonderful and important idea, because we've that we've been talking about intellect versus emotion, but we left out a bit which you just brought, and that's judgment. One of our, another one of our limitations to, to realization as adults is that we judge. We judge ourselves. We judge each other, and this also limits our scope for for love for loving. And that's, I think, isn't that, a, isn't that what a dream does? Just as you say, it's it's a place where there's no judgment, that everything's allowed, in a way. There's no morality, there's no... 
there's no judgment of any kind. So I think that's really, really, really beautiful and important idea. Yeah, I want to it's thank you very much for this clarification um, or like just, my personal jam of today's class that if I uh, try to read something, yeah. <laughs> it's not not yeah, love and information, um, so that I can I will try to make a intention or prayer that this when I read this knowledge may help me to come into love. I think we have the same prayer, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful to you, Devji, what I heard today. It's it's touched to my heart and uh, I have actually so much feelings today and so much remembrance of uh, Radha Krishna Lila and Manjari's service, Radha Dasim, mm. in what we read it. But I, I have just a question. Um, you talked about three principles of reading. I want to rem uh, remember this. Uh, first is uh, to read in humble way means always remember that it's more higher than I am. I'm just a servant of this message. And second is re this reading is bhajan means I'm serving with the flow of love of these feelings, this stream. I'm just the servant of I, like it's like pro providing like, this. Uh, as instrument of this flow in any place. Hmm. But the third principle, I not, not hear, not remember. What is the third principle? Uh, that the language is material energy. The language wow. is covering. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Rade. I don't know if this is just uh, thoughts I've had while we while we talking. Hmm. Wait, there's a chat there. Let's see. Distortions. Not a question. Okay. This uh, working. Uh, one thing I want to share in what, uh, what I today is understood is Buddhi Yoga means actually Raganuga Bhakti. Because yeah. Raganuga hmm. Bhakti is the whole in direction from inside. What's his direction? Is Raga, this feeling. Hmm. Hmm. Buddha, yoga man, Buddha yoga means Raganuga Bhakti. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. All right, everybody. So lovely to see you there. I can't quite make out all the faces, but uh, I see like, lots of smiles. <laughs> Much love to all of you. Jai Shri Radhe. Jai Jai Shri Radhe.